scripture reading for the lesson this morning comes from Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 36. Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 36. I'll be reading from the King James Version. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to the land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils a long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of, the most, of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him. And he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. When they that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told in the city and in the country. Then when they went out to see what was done, and came to Jesus, and found the man out of whom the devils had de were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, they were afraid. They also which saw it told them by what means, that he, what means he that was possessed of the devils was healed. The subject of demons is a very intriguing one, perhaps to most people, but certainly to students of the Bible. There are perhaps a handful of references to demons in the Old Testament, but there are no clear-cut, undeniable cases of demon possession recorded from Genesis to Malachi. Demons and demon possession really began to have a prominent place in the Bible during the public ministry of Jesus. Demons are also called unclean spirits, according to Luke 6.18. Foul spirits, according to Mark 9.25. And there are several other terms that they're known by throughout the scripture. Generally, in the King James Version of the Bible, you'll see them called devils. So as we read through the scripture, you'll, you'll see references to devils, but the meaning is demons. One thing we can know for certain about demons is that they are some sort of spirit entities. Jesus said in Luke 24, 39, Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Now when we consider the subject of demons and demon possession, we're not dealing with flesh and blood entities. We're dealing with some sort of a spirit entity. Spirit would be something invisible to the human eye and immaterial. That is, we cannot reach out and touch it. But now regarding the origin of demons, the Bible is silent. We can, however, draw some reasonable conclusions, but nothing can be stated, I suppose you could say, with absolute dogmatism to satiate, I suppose, the minds. If I were a teenager, I'd be paying attention. That would be me, because demons always interested me. And nobody, I never really recall anybody preaching on demons. But what would basically be the origin of demons? You've got really two, two choices that make somewhat common sense or reasonable conclusions. For one, they could be 
fallen angels. But there's a problem with that. It seems that as we go through the New Testament specifically, that demons always wanted to inhabit a living body, preferably a human body. Well, why would an angel want to inhabit a human body? So that, that, that's one option that is an option, but it doesn't make sense. The second one really makes the most amount of sense, is that demons were the wicked dead. That they were... They had been humans on this planet at some time. They had died. They had been sent to the Hadean realm. And for a period of time, God allowed them to go out and about into the world. And we'll see, ultimately, that reason was to prove the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And once the supremacy of Christ was established over all the spirit world, the apostles carried that on for a period of time as well. So in this sermon, we're going to consider demon possession and a few things associated with it. And here's the underlying question. Here's everything that we're going to try and answer today. Is demon possession possible today? Yes or no? The Bible answer to that is very clear. So by the time we get to this sermon, you may say, you know, that little boy acts like he's demon possessed. You probably won't say that again by the time we finish this sermon. So let's talk today about demon possession. And in the first place, we're going to talk about the certainty of demon possession in the first century. Now know this, demon possession was real. Those asserting, or really the, that the factual accounts of demon possession in the first century as recorded in the New Testament were various undiagnosed natural maladies such as epilepsy or mental illnesses, let me just state it plainly, they're wrong. When the Bible teaches that people were possessed with demons, that was not just some type of epilepsy. That was not just some type of mental illness. That was demon possession. Let me prove it to you. Look at me in the book of Matthew chapter 4. And notice the list of things that are stated in Matthew 4, really verse 24. But let's back up to Matthew 4 and verse 23 and roll right down into verse 24. Matthew 4, 23 says, And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Verse 24. And his fame went throughout all Syria. Now notice these things. Watch. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments. Now notice, in, in addition to that, and those which were possessed with devils demons, and those which were lunatic, perhaps the idea there is those epileptics, and those that had the palsy. And, what's the point? He healed them. Whatever their affliction was, when they got them to Jesus, what did Jesus do? He fixed what ailed them. Now notice that. The scripture itself makes a distinction between various physical illnesses and demon possession. Demon possession was not just some type of undiagnosed physical illness. It was its own thing. Spirit entities entered into the bodies generally of living people and took them over and did various terrible things to them as we'll see. But let's further establish the certainty of this. The unbelieving Jews, now the Jews who didn't even believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, the Son of the living God, they believed in demon possession. Are you aware of that? Look at me in Luke 11. Luke 11, and we'll just notice a few verses here and there. Luke 11, and let's notice verse 15. These individuals were there and they witnessed do, Jesus do something. Well, what did they think that Jesus did? Luke eleven fifteen. 15, But some of them said, He casteth out devils. He, he casts out demons through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. So they were convinced that Jesus cast out demons. But the problem in their mind was, where did he get that power? Where did he get the power? What they, Jesus did exactly what they saw him do. So they didn't try to deny that he cast out demons, but what they said is, well, he didn't do that by the power of God. 
He did that by the power of Beelzebub. And that, incidentally, is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. There's an example of it in the Bible. But notice also the unbelieving Jews believed in demon possession. But notice in this same context that Jesus, Jesus believed in demon possession. Look at verses 19 and 20. Jesus says, and if I, notice he didn't say he did it, but he says if, if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, meaning he did cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? If I cast them out by the power, so to speak, of Satan, how do your children, how do your sons, how do the, the other Jews of the first century, how do they do it? Therefore, shall they be your judges, but, notice in contrast, but if I, Jesus, with the finger of God cast out devils, that is demons, no doubt, the kingdom of God is come upon you. It was near to come right then. So Jesus affirmed that what the Jews witnessed was indeed the casting out of demons, but he also affirmed where he got this power. Where did he get it? He didn't get it from Beelzebub, did he? He got it from God himself. So it was of divine origin that Jesus cast out demons. But there's one more. You're aware that the apostles of Christ believed in demon possession. Look with me in the book of Acts. Look with me in Acts 5, and we'll notice verse 12 just for the context, but we're going to really look at verse 16. Acts 5, verse 12, just for the context. And by the hands of the apostles. Now, in this context, this is the apostles of Christ. Matthias was numbered with the 11, and there were 12. Paul is going to come a, a little later on in the book of Acts. So this is the 12. Judas Iscariot is, has died. He's hanged himself. And now Matthias is numbered with them, and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders. That's Bible language for miraculous activity. Wrought among the people. And then you have a parenthetical statement, but skip down to verse number 16. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks of all sorts. But notice, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits. Meaning what? They were possessed by demons. And they were healed. How many? How many of them were healed by the time they got them to the apostles of Christ in Acts 5? You got them there, what happened? They were healed everyone. Everyone. Well, the evidence should be clear and complete, shouldn't it? Demon possession in the first century is a biblical certainty. And those with honest and good hearts believe everything the Bible teaches to be true simply because the Bible teaches it to be true. You know, one thing we don't need to try and do ever is look for a way to explain the Bible away. You're aware of James 2 and verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Let me give you something. Let me get you this. Watch. How many times do we dismiss this verse? How many times do our religious friends dismiss this verse? Watch. Just like they dismiss demon possession in the first century. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, why would we try and dismiss demon possession in the first century? The Bible's clear on that. Why would we try to dismiss being baptized to be saved? It's just as clear, isn't it? Indeed it is. Let's move on. In the second place, let's talk now about the calamity. The calamity associated with demon possession in the first century. Stated plainly, demon possession was horrible. Some of the saddest accounts in the Bible are associated with demon possession. For example, in Luke 13, 11, a woman afflicted by a spirit of infirmity was bent over, unable to straighten herself for 18 years. Can you imagine that? It seems like, you know, you're, I'm, I'm standing straight up right now. Imagine if I were just bent over at the waist and I stayed that way 18 years. Well, why was she in that condition? 
She was afflicted by a spirit of infirmity. That's another way to express she was possessed by demons, or at least a demon. Another example in Matthew 12, 22, records a demon rendering a person blind and without the ability to speak. But you know what's interesting? As you go through the Bible, especially the New Testament, and you begin to study things about demons, demons never spoke blasphemous things about Jesus. They never spoke blasphemous things about God. In fact, sometimes those demons spoke better about Jesus than the non-possessed people that were standing around watching Jesus cast out demons. Let's consider two examples. Look at our scripture reading beginning in Luke 8. And we're not going to read through all this, but we're just going to look at bits and pieces of it again. And we're going to try to notice the calamity associated with demon possession in the first century. Parallel accounts of Luke 8, 26 through 36 are also found in Matthew 8, 28 through 34, and Mark 5, 1 to 20. Notice verse 26 of Luke 8. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And he, that's Jesus, went forth to land, and there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils, that is demons, long time. How long is long time? I don't know. But it's longer than a short time, wouldn't you say? And, now notice this. Notice how demon-possessed people acted sometimes. And wear no clothes. Neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. Now that's sad right there in and of itself. Verse 28. Notice, watch, watch what happens. Here what, what, what they looked up and saw was a man. But demons had overtaken that man's body so that he was no longer in control. Watch. Verse 28. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? Wait a minute. Before we go any further, before we go any further, James 2.19 believes that the demons, proves rather that the demons believe. Here's an example of a demon confessing the deity of Jesus Christ. Now watch. I'm going to make a point, strong point by the end of this sermon. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. Surely you see that. Demons believed, demons confessed, and they still knew torment was awaiting them. Now what happens if somebody teaches you the plan of salvation that all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus? What have you done any more than a demon did? What have you done any more than what a demon did. Demons believe. Demons confess. And here this demon says, don't torment me. I don't want to be tormented. And they believed and they confessed the deity of Jesus. Now you let that simmer in your mind as we move forward through the rest of this sermon. Now, look down at verse 29. Parenthetical. Notice the calamity associated with this. For he had commanded the unclean spirit, that's the demon. We'll see it's demons plural. To come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him, this demon-possessed man, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil, the demon, into the wilderness. Isn't that sad? It's so sad when you begin to look at this and the calamity associated with demon-possessed people. Verse 30, and Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion. You begin to do a little bit of research on this, and a Roman legion was composed of thousands of men, perhaps even as many as 6,000. How many demons had overtaken this man's body? I don't know. But it seems to indicate a very large, unusually large amount of demons were in this man's body. He said legion because many devils, that is many demons, were entered into him, and they, the demons, besought him, Jesus, that he would not command them to go out into the deep. What's the deep? The only thing that I can wrap my mind around that makes any sense is where did they, where did they come from? They were the wicked dead. What happens when you die wicked? You go to the Hadean realm, but the Hadean realm has two parts. 
There's paradise. When Jesus died, that's where he went. But then you have the other side of that. Perhaps it's known as torment. Generally, it would be known as Tartarus. And it's likened unto being on fire when you look at the, the rich man of Luke 16. So the deep there, they understood that when Jesus commanded them to go, they're going right back to torment. They're going right back, and that's why they don't want to go. Don't command us. And they understood that Jesus had the ability to say, when you're gone, you're gone. So they're begging Jesus, don't do us like this. Now, for the sake of time, we understand what happens here. They're sent into a herd of swine. The swine run off and, and are drowned. But look at verse 35. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom. Notice, the, in order to come out of, they had to be in him. They were inhabiting his physical body. Out of whom the devils, the demons were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed and in his right mind. And notice this, and they were afraid. They were afraid of him when he was demon-possessed. They're afraid of him when he's not demon-possessed. They couldn't wrap their minds around this. Now, I want to show you another account, and it's in Mark 9. And understand that demon possession in the first century didn't just happen to adults or to bad people or to grown people. Demon possession also occurred to innocent living children. That's sad. Now, for the sake of time, look with me in Mark 9, and let's begin in verse 20. What are we noticing? We're noticing the calamity associated with demon possession. Mark 9, 20, And they brought him, this demon-possessed child, unto him, Jesus. And when he, the demon-possessed child, saw him, straightway the spirit, the demon, tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. Put, you, put yourself right there. There's your young child, demon-possessed. And this demon is tearing up the inside of your child. Isn't that sad? Wouldn't that be awful to watch? I don't know if you've ever had... I, one time in my life I saw a person have an epileptic seizure. And that, I'm not trying to say this was an epileptic seizure. This person was demon-possessed. But that'll stick with me probably to the day I die. If you ever see someone live time have an epileptic seizure, it's rough. And a lot of times the people that have them have them daily or regularly. And that, imagine if that were your child. Wouldn't that be tough? Yes, indeed it would. Verse 21, He, Jesus, asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. Since he was a little boy, it seems. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire. The demon tried to cast this young boy into the fire. And into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, what do you think Jesus is going to do? You think Jesus is going to turn his nose up and walk off? Oh, no. Jesus does what Jesus does best. Now, notice verse 26 again for the sake of time. Jesus has commanded the demon, demons, however many, to come out. Verse 26, and the spirit cried and rent him sore. And came out of him. And he, this demon-possessed child, was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Now notice, we didn't get all the context of this, but notice verses 28 and 29. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast him out? Apparently they tried. They couldn't get it done at this time. Verse 29, And he, Jesus, said unto them, his disciples, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Some demons apparently were tougher to expel than others. Let me give you a practical application. There may be times in our lives when it seems like we cannot defeat certain afflictions. It is in those difficult times that we need to practice what has been preached. Consider 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Let me, let me give you another one with that. It would be 1 Peter 5, 7. 
casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Now, we're going to see that demon possession no longer occurs in today's life, but that doesn't mean afflictions of various kinds do not occur. Now, here were, were, was a family that was afflicted and afflicted terribly. No one today is necessarily going to be demon possessed, but are we going to be afflicted and afflicted terribly? Indeed, we can. So what must we do? Cast all our care. There are times where that's all we can do. Cast all our care upon the Lord, for he cares for us. Well, how do we do that? Pray without ceasing. Now we've noted the calamity associated with demon possession, but now in the third place, let's get to clarity. And let's really try to answer our opening question definitively by the scripture. Is anyone anywhere demon possessed today? The Bible answer to that is no. No. Demon possession was temporary. The Bible does not give a specific detailed answer as to why God allowed people to be demon possessed in the first century, but when compiling all the evidence, one answer is reasonable, and it is this. Demon possession was allowed to prove the supremacy of Jesus over the spirit realm. That seems to be the simple answer. That's why you really don't see any clear-cut cases of demon possession going back into the Old Testament. Yes, there are some passages which mention demons, but there's really nothing that you can nail down and say, this person for sure was demon-possessed. But by the time we begin reading the book of Matthew in the New Testament, it doesn't take long, does it? And there were demon-possessed people. Why? God allowed it temporarily to prove the superiority, the supremacy of Jesus over the spirit realm. And the apostles continued with the ability to cast out demons for a time to establish that they were telling the truth about Jesus and the church. The last account of biblical demon possession, if I look correctly, is recorded really in Acts 19 verses 11 through 16. Verses 11 and 12 there give account that even certain items that had been on the apostle Paul, such as handkerchiefs and the like, that if people touched them, it would heal them supernaturally. It would cast out demons in that way. And then you read on down in that same account about the seven sons of one Sceva, who, who they thought they were exorcists and they went to go cast out a demon and it backfired. It, it didn't work out quite the way that they thought it would. Now demons are mentioned on throughout the New Testament, but that seems to be the last account in the Bible of demon possession. Now, when we look at demon possession, it had to have been supernatural. That's not the natural order of things. That's not how it was as it seems in the Old Testament, though miracles did occur in the Old Testament, but it was supernatural, miraculous, and all miraculous activity has ceased. You say, the Bible doesn't teach that. Yes, the Bible does teach that. Look at me in 1 Corinthians 13. The book of 1 Corinthians is really about church problems but it's more than that. It's about church problems and solutions. The first century church of Christ at Corinth was having problems with spiritual gifts, with miraculous gifts. They were, they were puffed up. They were abusing them on the one hand. So in chapter 12, you have spiritual gifts. Chapter 14, you have spiritual gifts. And then what's the solution? Well, 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter, isn't it? That's going to be the solution. But notice what the Apostle Paul says by inspiration in 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 8. Charity, that is love, never faileth. But in contrast to what never fails, whether there be prophecies, that's miraculous, that's supernatural, what's going to happen? They shall fail. Whether there be tongues, that is, the ability to speak known languages that you never studied, that was supernatural, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge. Now, what's knowledge in the context? Supernatural, miraculous knowledge. It shall vanish away. Why? For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But notice he gives the time. Verse 10. But when that which is perfect, when that which is complete is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Well, what's that which is in part? It was the supernatural. So now we just have to try and cement in our minds that which is perfect is what? 
I would say if you ask most people in the denominational world, they'll say, that's Jesus. Jesus hadn't come back, so all these miracles are still occurring. Well, have you read the New Testament and seen the type of miracles that the apostles did, that Jesus did? Where's the man walking on the water? We can even go back to the Old Testament. Where's the man parting the Red Sea? Where's that? They're not occurring. That which is perfect, that which is complete, is the New Testament. When the New Testament was completed in its final written form, there was no more need for miracles. When you read Mark 16, 17 through 20, Hebrews 2, 1 to 4, the two main purposes of miracles were to reveal the truth and to confirm the truth. Well, I would ask you, has all the truth been revealed? Read Jude 3. Has all the truth been confirmed? Read Jude 3. Guess what? Miracles are done away. So there is no one today who is demon-possessed. Now, let me state this. Mental illnesses are real. Palsy, paralysis, things like that, those are real, okay? We're not trying to just lump all this and, you know, say that, Every person who has a problem, you know, that all of it was all supernatural in the Bible, and that's not the case. Mental illnesses are real. Paralysis and things along those lines are real. But notice this, and don't, don't miss this about this sermon. Any time that we do something wrong, we can't say the devil made me do it. Any time we do something wrong, we can't say, well, I was demon-possessed when I did that. We cannot say that. We are responsible for our own actions. James 1, 13 to 15 says, Let no man say, When he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust, unlawful desires, hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Your son's not demon-possessed. Your grandson's not demon-possessed. No one you've ever met in all your life is demon-possessed. If they do anything wrong, it's on no one but them. When we do things wrong, it's on no one but us. Now demons, if you paid attention and let this simmer in your mind for a little while, Demons believed in the one true God. Demons confessed the deity of Jesus Christ, and yet those demons knew that torment still awaited them. You understand that most people today have done no more than what the demons of the New Testament did. Friend, it's time to wake up. Do you know how dangerous it is if your plan of salvation that you obeyed however many years ago is all that a demon did? Wouldn't that be sad to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and say, what have you done? I did what the demons did. What? If all we do is what the demons did, we can expect to go where the demons are going to go. Demon possession was limited to the first century. None today can push off their sins on demons. You understand, we as mankind, we have a universal problem. That universal problem is sin. So God has developed the one final universal solution to our sin problem. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does the gospel of Jesus Christ teach that we must all do to have our sins washed away by the blood of Christ? We have to hear the truth, Acts 18.8. We have to believe the truth, Acts 16.31. We have to repent of sin, Acts 17, 30. We have to confess openly and freely that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8, 37. We have to be immersed in water for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38, so that the blood of Jesus Christ will wash away all our sins and that he will add us to the one true church, the church of Christ, Acts 2, 47, Romans 16, 16. You say, well, I've done that, okay. What happens when a Christian sins? Acts 8, 22. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. You're invited. Will you come? Do so now. As together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.